Let's worship together today. We bring our praise, you bring revival. We lift our heads, you lift our eyes up. Where your love is found, there will be no fear. God, your kingdom come, your will be done here. On earth is in heaven, spirit. Jesus, we need you now, so come. 
prayer that you would come have your way in our hearts.
hearts that you would break our walls down. That your spirit would pour out in this place today, God, and that um, that you would continue transforming us more and more into your image. So that these words that we sing when we say, Jesus, we love you, it wouldn't just be words of a song, Lord, but that we would be living those words. Lord, be glorified in our song and in our lives. Oh, Jesus, we love another this morning as you're being seated. Good morning, ladies. Aren't we privileged to be able to come here and study the Bible? Not everywhere can you do that. And I loved in one of the songs that we sang, it said, your constant grace is our cornerstone. And we're going to actually be talking a little bit about that today. So let's go ahead and open in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you've given us. We thank you for this gathering, Lord, of women. And we especially thank you for your word, Lord. As we dig into Galatians 3, Lord, I just ask that you would um, open our hearts to what you want us to hear and that we would be able to apply what it is that you want us to do, Lord. And we bring this time into your hands. We love you and we praise you in your name. Amen. So Warren Wearsby says that Galatians 3 and 4 are among the strongest of Paul's writings. And he was talking to a primarily Gentile audience who possibly didn't have the law at all or didn't even know what the law was, but that yet Judaizers had come in and um, attempted to add requirements to what you needed to do regarding salvation. But do you think they were any match for Paul? (laughs) Probably not. Would you want to be debating Paul? I wouldn't. Think about it. He had spent a good portion of his life studying Jewish law, and he was probably an experienced orator. So when he presented his arguments regarding faith rather than works, he showed such wisdom in in how he presented his arguments. The facts that he presented, they were perfect in informing the Galatians of the truth and challenging what the Judaizers were saying, that you have to add works to your faith. And I like the fact that he quoted a lot of Old Testament scriptures to prove his points, and also he used Abraham as an example, which a lot of the Jews, that was their father, so they would respect anything that came from Abraham. So I'll go into a little more detail on those Old Testament scriptures in just a little bit, uh, as well as Abraham. Um, But just think about how deep this book of Galatians is. There's There's um, so much doctrine in it, and we're going to be talking and focusing on some of those doctrines that we as believers should be very familiar with. So first of all, the whole book talks about law versus faith, Um, and of course it refutes the whole idea that salvation is not just by faith, but you have to have works too. Paul gives great arguments for simple faith in God's promises and not simple faith plus you need to do this. So Pastor Jack just recently, I think it it might have been been Sunday, talked about the fact that the word for law was pedagogue. So we studied that a little bit in our lesson this week. Um, The law was actually given to show the the presence of sinfulness and the need to address that sin. So it was never the solution for sinfulness. It was kind of like a mirror to show them and show us how messed up we really are. The law was a means of checking sins and it was in charge until Christ came. So it was temporary until the seed, which in our chapter it had seed with a capital S, remember that? That refers to Jesus, until the seed came. A couple verses here. John 1.17 says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And then Romans 3.20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So in the beginning of the chapter, in both 
uh, both verses one and three, Paul calls the Galatians foolish. So that's not the kind of foolish that we think of when we use that word, um, but the, the Greek word means not using your mind or spiritually dull. It's kind of the difference we see between wisdom and, and knowledge. So we can have a lot of knowledge, but don't necessarily have wisdom. Wisdom is being able to use your knowledge in a good way. So in verses two and three, Paul asks them if they received the spirit through their works. I think it was a little bit sarcastic because I think they would have to answer no, they did not have the spirit just through, through their works. He was helping them to think logically. We know that we receive the indwelling Holy Spirit at the time we believe, at the time of our salvation. The Holy Spirit then enables us to live out our faith. So the evidence of being a believer or a follower of Christ is having the Holy Spirit. So there are two different aspects of the Holy Spirit in the believer's life. They are indwelling and empowerment. So the indwelling, we receive that when we're saved. Immediately the Holy Spirit comes with us and stays with us. We receive the empowerment of the Holy Spirit when we call on him daily to fill us. That's important to do every morning. Some call this filling every day. Some will say that's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes the empowerment, which we do daily, is given to us to accomplish a specific task or to um, get something done. But both are given through faith in God's promise to do what he says he will do. So remember the difference, the indwelling and the empowerment. This week's lesson had a selection of scriptures that um, talked about the Holy Spirit, and I wanted to add a few more that add different aspects of who the Holy Spirit is. There's four of them here. John 16, eight says, when he has come, meaning the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. So it's interesting, we don't even come to Jesus without the help of God. The Holy Spirit has to convict us or show us our need of cleansing and show us our sins. The next one is John 3, 5. Jesus said, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. So what does that mean? Just, if you'll remember when Jesus was talking to the woman at the well, he said that he could give her living water. So I think in this verse, when they're talking about water and the Spirit, it refers to inner purification and cleansing that comes about through the work of the Holy Spirit in us. The third verse is 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. So the believer is automatically joined into what we call the body of Christ, and Christ being the head of that body. And then the last of the four verses, Ephesians 1.13, in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So we were sealed with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? So a seal is usually a sign of ownership or it's a guarantee of what has been promised. So the, uh, the Holy Spirit seals us as sons of God eternally, forever. It can't be taken away or reversed. We are sealed in him. So then what is our responsibility? We are to walk in the Spirit. And if we jump ahead a little bit, uh, in chapter 5 of Galatians, we, we hear that we are to walk in the Spirit. So I, um, I imagine we'll be talking more about that when we get to that lesson. But just for now, know that successful Christian living as a believer involves walking in the Spirit. We can't do it on our own. It's all through the Holy Spirit, right? So then let's talk a little bit about Abraham. Um, Paul brings up Abraham in verses 6 through 8. And it's interesting that the Judaizers, they were focusing on Moses and the law. But Paul went back even further than Moses to Abraham. Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation, and Jews were very proud of their relationship with Abraham as their father, and some even um, 
relied on their relationship with Abraham, Abraham for their salvation. One of the verses that expresses that whole attitude is Matthew 3, 9. It says, do not think to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. A little bit of a put down, isn't there? <laughs> Abraham was the model of faith. He demonstrated obedient faith. So it wasn't just intellectual believing. When God, God told him to leave his home and travel to a place that he didn't know of, he went. And when God asked him to take his son Isaac and travel up the mountain and lay him on an altar, he did it. And he, he obeyed God up until the moment that God stopped him. So it was active faith, faith in action. God said go, God said go, and he went. So it really made me look at my own faith and wonder, do I have an active faith? Do I obey like Abraham did? So as believers, we are spiritual descendants of Abraham, and inclusion in Abraham's family was never intended to rely on circumcision. It was always going to be about faith. So if we are of the same faith as Abraham, then we share in the same blessings as Abraham. He believed God, and it says it was accounted to him for righteousness. So what was Abraham's faith in? It was his faith in the fact that God would do what he promised. Abraham didn't always know the details of what that was gonna look like, but God, if God promised it, he believed it, and that was credited to him for righteousness. So that brings us to talking a little bit about faith. What is faith? The Greek word is pistis. Faith is confidence, reliance, assurance, and trust. In the Old Testament and the New Testament, faith is the way that uh, believers related to God, or the way a person related to God. And Abraham was the archetype of this kind of faith. I like Hebrews 11.1, 1, which says, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So I like those words, being sure and certain. Abraham was sure and certain that God would do what he had promised. So if you read the accounts of faithful people in Hebrews 11, you'll find that faith was usually connected with a promise from God. So here again, Abraham's faith was connected to a promise from God. Confidence that God will do as he has promised, that's the essence of faith. There's an interesting word study in verse two. Um, Galatians 3.2 says, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law? or by the hearing of faith. So the Greek word for hearing, it's a word mean, meaning to listen and obey. So the word used connects faith with listening and obeying. It's an act of faith, something for us to remember. I had to ask myself, do I have that kind of confidence that God will do all that he has promised me? Am I sure and certain of it? Good question for all of us to ask ourselves. When it comes to salvation, I am sure and certain that I am saved and I'm going to be with heaven one day for eternity. But when it comes to everyday living, I'm not sure that I trust and rely on every one of his promises. And I think we can all look at ourselves and, and think about that. But if if I want to live by those promises in the scripture, that means that I need to know what they are. So living by faith requires that I be familiar with all those promises. That would be probably a whole nother study in itself to study the promises of God. Be a, an interesting study, wouldn't it? There was one author that I read that said he, he starts out every day in the morning by reviewing the promises of God. He's collected some of the ones that are meaningful to him and, and written them all out and every morning he goes over those. I like that challenge of doing that and I think that all of us, if we did that, probably our days would be very different. Oswald Chambers said, faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one who is leading. So let me read that one again, I like that. Faith never knows where it is being led, but it loves and knows the one 
who is leading. So now let's talk a little bit about promises. We've seen this word quite a few times in this chapter. Um, Let me read verse 14 of Galatians 3. It says that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. The Greek word for promise is epangelia, and I probably have slaughtered that pronunciation, but it is a guarantee and it's often used in the context of covenants. In verses 15 to 18, Paul uses the word promise eight times. And the promise to Abraham was that all the nations would be blessed through him. And then in verse 17 of the chapter, it talks about the covenant that was confirmed before by God in Christ. So Paul in this chapter talks about blessings, promises, covenants. So what is the blessing of Abraham? In Genesis 12, one through three, we see many promises that God made to Abraham, and we call all those promises the Abrahamic covenant. But I think what this verse refers specifically to is that Abraham was told that in his seed, meaning Jesus, all nations would be blessed. That justification by faith is made, is made available to every believer, Jews and Gentiles. Abraham was blessed by being the the foundation, the father of the Jewish nation, but more so he was blessed that the seed, Jesus, came through his line. And remember that God made these promises to Abraham way before he even had any children. So again, Abraham showed such an obedient faith. He didn't know how that was gonna happen, but he believed. So in in the Old Testament, it's interesting, when a covenant was made, or the way it was confirmed was that an animal was slaughtered, they would take the two pieces and put side by side so there was a, a walkway in the middle. And then the two sides that were making the covenant would walk down the middle. And by doing that, they confirmed that they both agreed with that covenant. So with God's, Abraham, with God's covenant with Abraham, Abraham slaughtered a bullock and then he took the pieces and he laid them side by side, and then he waited for God to appear. He waited and waited, and he ended up falling asleep, but while he was sleeping, um, a burning torch and a smoking oven went through the walkway. God had come. He had shown up, but he'd walked through on his own. And what this symbolizes is that that covenant was unilateral, it was totally one-sided. It had nothing to do with anything that Abraham had to do. Abraham just had to believe. God did it all. So that's what grace and faith is all about. It's God's promises to Abraham, um, and it was only dependent on Abraham to believe. And of course, Abraham did demonstrate the faith to believe that. So as Paul talks about Abraham's faith and the promises of God, we come to verses 6 through 13, where Paul refers back to the scriptures in the Old Testament to prove his point. And the point was that salvation was by faith only and not by works. So he brings up six different passages to defend his position. Um, Think about it, if anyone knew the scriptures well, it would be Paul, who had been a Pharisee among Pharisees. I like to think about, um, I think it was a couple weeks back when we talked about the fact that Paul had spent time in the desert Um, in Arabia after he was converted. And and I think one of the questions in our lesson was, what do you think he was doing then? But I like to think of the fact that he was probably going over all these scriptures that he knew so well, and I just picture a light going on, and all of a sudden him realizing what they all meant before he didn't. Um, And so now he knew the scripture had new meaning to him. So there's six of those. I'd like to take a look at those and read those, the ones that Paul quoted. And the first one is from Genesis 15, 6. And it says, and he believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. So that means righteousness was put into Abraham's account. The sin was removed from that account and it was replaced by righteousness in the eyes of God. The second verse was Genesis 12, 3 which says, I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse those who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. 
It's amazing to me that way back in the times of Abraham, God had already planned to bring salvation to both Jews and Gentiles. From the very beginning, that's what the plan was. And here it says all the families of the earth. I'm very grateful for that because it includes me. The third verse is Deuteronomy 27, 26. It says, cursed, cursed is the one who does not confirm all the words of this law by observing them. Notice that the verse says all the words. So we're doomed from the start. If we do not obey the law in every detail, there's no way we can be saved. We, we can't mess up at all, not in one little minor thing. And then the fourth one is um, Habakkuk 2.4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. We, we have read that phrase often in the Bible and in the New Testament, um, the books of Romans, Galatians, and Hebrews all talk about being justified and living by faith. Leviticus 18.5 says, you shall therefore keep my statutes and my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. I am the Lord. So in other words, believing the law was not enough. One would have to live and do the law. And then the last one, Deuteronomy 21, 23, says, for he who is hanged is accursed of God. And of course, when Paul quotes it in Galatians, he, he actually says, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And of course, we all see the reference to Jesus and the fact that he was given the most shameful death hanging on a cross. But again, that was prophesied that that would happen. That was all part of the plan. And in doing that, Christ redeemed us from the curse of sin, the curse that the law showed us. So in Israel, the usual method of capital punishment was stoning. So if a really shameful crime was committed, they would hang the person. And to be exposed for everyone to see was very shameful for the Jews because they were very careful in how they treated a dead body. So you think about what Christ did for us. He took that curse on himself, the curse that was really on us, hung on that cross and did it because of love. Obviously, Paul used his extensive knowledge of scripture to back up his arguments, probably better than anyone else could do that. Um, to me, it's so exciting to see that God used Paul where he was at. He had this extensive training and knowledge and God used that after he was converted and became a believer. It reminds me a little bit of Romans 8.28 as well, where we know that all things, God can work all things together for good if we love him and are called by him. And I like the fact that Paul used scripture in his arguments. Where else do you see someone using scripture? You remember? Jesus' temptations. When he was tempted, he quoted scripture. Also, Paul brings up Abraham, who was recognized as the father of the Jews. I think he was very wise in doing that because Abraham was someone that all the Jews recognized and could relate to. So Paul demonstrated probably the most perfect defense of faith alone, just like the legal defense you would see in a courtroom. I kind of pictured him as the attorney in a courtroom. And obviously, it was not him. It was the Holy Spirit working through him. So then I want to talk a little bit about doctrine. In these same verses, we see Paul bringing up certain doctrines that are central to our Christian faith. Um, we know that salvation comes from faith in Christ's death and resurrection to pay the penalty for our sins. But sometimes we forget that salvation encompasses more than just that act of faith. It has so many different aspects that we lose, we lose sight of how far-reaching it really is. So I'd like to spend some time talking about several doctrines that are all part of our salvation. So first of all, just talking about salvation itself, the Bible tells us, of course, that we all have sinned and therefore we're separated from God. We were created to have a relationship with God, but then that sin um, separated us from that relationship. And even worse, that separation is for all eternity in this life and the next. So what was the solution? Jesus was the way of salvation. He took our sin upon himself, died in our place, took those sins on himself so that we would be forgiven, and then three days later, 
he rose again, proving that he had victory over sin and death. So basically, Jesus died so that we could live. So if we place our faith in Jesus, trusting his death as payment for our sins, then all our sins are forgiven and washed away. And then we know that we will have life after we die, resurrected life in heaven with Jesus. Salvation is a free gift, so we can't try to earn it by works. I think of a person, when they give you a gift, what do you think about if they run and get something from their own and come and give it back to you right away? Doesn't that kind of devalue the gift that, that you've given them? You didn't really want or expect that. You didn't want anything back. In fact, it may even feel like an insult if they do that. So if we try to add our works to what Christ did for us, it really insults him and takes away from his free gift. So in Galatians 3, Paul brings up a couple terms that we'll talk about. Um, he talks about being redeemed and being justified. So redemption and justification, they're both aspects of salvation. And then along with redemption and justification, a few more that I'm gonna talk about are grace, sanctification, and glorification. So first, let's talk about grace. It's all about grace. That is the undeserved love in favor of God. It's a spontaneous gift from God, generous, free, and undeserved. The, un, the entire scope of our salvation is based on grace from the time that we're saved to our daily life as a believer and to our life in eternity. It's all about grace, God's grace. Have you noticed that Paul has started out most of his letters in the New Testament with, he'll say, grace and peace to you. So grace is central to salvation. Sinners are saved by grace, but then they also live by grace. Grace is the way to life and the way of life. Hebrews 4.16 says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It makes me think about an old hymn, He Giveth More Grace. I don't know if any of you remember that hymn, but I wanted to read just a, a, a few stanzas from that. It says, he giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he multiplied grace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed ere the day is half done, when we reach the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving is, has only begun. His love is no limit, his grace has no measure, his power no boundary known unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. Love that hymn. So the entire scope of our salvation is based on grace. So I'm gonna break it down in three different aspects. So in the past, our salvation involves redemption and justification, we'll talk about that. In the present, our salvation is being worked out by our sanctification. So the just is not just saved by faith, but lives by faith. And then in the future, our salvation involves our glorification. So three different aspects, the past, the present, and the future. But all three are by grace, through faith. From the Father, through the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. And the way we participate is by submitting and receiving. So first, let's talk about redemption. It happens at the time we are saved. In verse 13, Paul says that Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So there are several different Greek words that are used for redemption. They have very similar meanings, but the one used here is exagerazo, which means to buy out, to purchase out of the market. It's related to the Greek word agora, or marketplace, so it refers to purchasing or ransoming a person, like a slave might be purchased from the slave market. So the meanings of redemption are to free by paying a ransom price. So if we think about that definition, to free or to purchase a slave for the purpose of setting him free, can we apply this to our salvation? I think we can. Christ purchased us through his death. 
He bought us back from the penalty of sin for the purpose of setting us free to serve him. Christ's death in our place paid the price for our release from sin, freeing us from the curse of the law and releasing us to serve Christ in a new life of grace. When I was a child, I used to go to a, a camp in the, the north woods of the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, a great, beautiful place. But every evening uh, in the dining hall before dinner, they would display all the things that had been lost for the day. And if you had something there, you actually had to go up and they asked you to redeem it. And what that meant, you had to do something to buy it back. So you had to sing a song or say a verse or tell a joke. Or, and, and as a little child, it was interesting because that helped me remember what it means to redeem. It's to buy back. And that's what God did for us. The next word um, I want to talk about is justification. And that's uh, verses 8 and 11. Paul talks about being justified. At the time we are saved, we're redeemed, but we're also justified. So what does that mean? So when we're justified, the very righteousness of God is reckoned, credited, and imputed to us. Being justified means that God looks at us just, not just as forgiven, but as if we had never sinned at all. So it's more than taking away our sins, it's taking those sins away, but then clothing us in righteousness. That's justification. So in being justified, all Jewish and Gentile believers are considered true sons of Abraham. Because just like Abraham, the believer is saved by grace through faith, cleared from every charge of guilt. Verse 11 says, the just shall live by faith. Um, the three New Testament passages that repeat that same phrase are, of course, Galatians 3, and then Romans 1, 16 and 17, and then Hebrews 10, 38. They all talk about the just shall live by faith. Two verses I want to add here on justification. Uh, Romans 4, 5. It says, but to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. And then Romans 4, 24 and 25 says, it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. The next term I want to talk about is sanctification. So this is the present. This is happening now as we walk with Jesus. So again, the just is not only saved by faith, but lives by faith. So the word sanctification, it's related to the word saint. And both sanctification and saint, both those words have to do with holiness. To sanctify something is to set it apart for special use, or to sanctify a person means to make him holy. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. This is also the work of the Holy Spirit. We can't start out by being saved by faith and then revert to works for being sanctified or being made holy. We are saved by faith and we will also be used by God in faith. So again, our, um, our faith is being worked out in the present. And again, we rely on the Holy Spirit to help us in the sanctification process day by day. John Corson had a quote that I liked. He said, our ministry, our service, and our walk with the Lord is not based on our great works of faith, but simply upon our faith in a great God. Right? It's not based on what we do. It's based on what he does in us. So although we are positionally holy, we know that we still sin. So positionally holy, when God redeemed and justified, he sees us as righteous but we know that we still sin. 1 John 1.10 says, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. But progressive sanctification is the effect of obedience to the word of God in, in our lives. Progressive means that it's ongoing. So day by day, we're being sanctified. It's the same as growing in the Lord or maturing spiritually. God started the work of making us like Christ and he is going to continue that. 
until the day we go be with him. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing that he who started a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So this type of sanctification is something that we should all seek after. And then 1 Peter 1.15 says, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. And then John 17.17, 17, sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. So we are called saints, hegioi in the Greek, or sanctified ones. So prior to salvation, our behavior showed that our standing in the world was separation from God. After salvation, our behavior shows that our standing before God is separation from the world. So little by little, Every day, those who are being sanctified are being more like Christ, and that is what our goal is, to have the Holy Spirit work so fervently within us that we become more and more like Christ. Hebrews 10, 14 says, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So think about what we have to guide us as believers. We have the New Testament, we have examples from Christ's life on the earth, his example, we have his words that he gave us, but more than all of that, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit every day working within us uh, to guide us and direct us. So every, every day we can claim, every minute we can claim the Holy Spirit's power. But just remember our daily sanctification, it's wholly accomplished by God's grace through the power of the Holy Spirit and then saturating ourselves in the word of God. So the, the last area I wanted to talk about as far as um, doctrine is its future. Part of our future salvation is called glorification. So the glorified state will be our ultimate separation from sin. Total sanctification in every regard. It's hard to imagine, isn't it? It'll occur when Christ comes for us and we enter into eternity with him. Two verses here, 1 John 3, 2 says, Beloved now, we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And then Colossians 3, 4 says, When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Paul often speaks of Christ as the hope of glory, and he links Christ appearing to our glorification. Again, glorification is God's final re removal of sin from our lives, if you're a believer. At Christ's coming, the glory of God, his honor, his praise, his majest majesty and holiness, it'll all be realized in us. So instead of mortals being burdened with a sin nature, we'll be immortal and holy with direct and unrestricted access to God and his presence. We'll enjoy holy communion with him throughout eternity. A beautiful thought, huh? So to recap these doctrines that I've talked about, first, grace. It's totally by God's grace that we have been offered salvation and forgiveness of sins. Past, present, future. In the past, we've been redeemed and justified. Redemption, we were brought back from the power that sin had over us totally through God's grace. Justification, our sins were forgiven and removed from us and we were clothed in righteousness, totally through God's grace. And then in the present, we have sanctification. We've been set apart for God and are being made holy through the work of the Holy Spirit. Again, totally through God's grace. And then in the future, glorification, one day we'll be glorified in eternity and freed from the presence and the effect of sin. I look forward to that. Again, totally through God's grace. So we praise God for his grace in the past, his grace in the present, and his grace in the days to come. So let's just pray. Dear Father, we thank you for your grace, Lord, and um, all that means to us, Lord, in, in our redemption, in our justification, 
our ongoing sanctification, Lord, and eventual glorification. We thank you and praise you for all that. We're overwhelmed by what you've done for us. So be with each of us, Lord, as we go to our groups and we discuss the lesson. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this place that we can come and honor you and learn of you, Lord. In your name, amen.